Thank you for joining um, our seminar today. We are the Maternal and Child Health Student Association, and we're always looking for new members. We hold seminars like these pretty regularly. So if you think this topic is interesting, there will also be an evaluation sent to you after this seminar, and you can rate the seminar. You can suggest new topics that you might find interesting, and we'll vote on them, and we'll see which one wins. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it to Camila, who is a member of MCHSA, and she's actually the one who recommended this topic. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Health Equity and Maternal and Child Health. The U.S. outranks every other high-income country in pregnancy-related deaths. Despite vast improvements in health care, maternal mortality continues to rise. The data reveals significant racial and ethnic disparities in maternal morbidity and mortality, with Black and American Indian and Alaska Native women shown having higher rates of pregnancy-related death compared to white women. Black American Indian and Alaska Native and also Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander women are more likely than white women to have certain birth risk factors that contribute to infant mortality as well as higher shares of preterm births, low birth rate births, or births for which they received late or no prenatal care compared to white women, which can have and has had long-term consequences for the physical and cognitive health of children. Today's speaker is an associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology here at UAB and associate dean for diversity, equity, and inclusion at the UAB School of Public Health. Her research focuses on health disparities related to COVID-19, cardiometabolic diseases, and science communication with a special focus on Latino populations and genomics. Please help me welcome Dr. Bertha Hidalgo. Hello, Dr. Hidalgo. Hi, Camila. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. And I'm so glad that you started out with some of the statistics um, for this topic, because what I am going to concentrate this talk on are some of the actions that we're taking to address those disparities and in health inequities in maternal and child health. And so I want to encourage you all, since this is um, this is an opportunity, I think, to really have a conversation around this topic, to put your questions in the chat as you go, or um, I'll keep my uh, gallery open um, to the extent possible as I share my presentation. And so if you want to raise your hand as we go, I think that's going to be okay. I prepared way too many slides, so I, I may skip through some, but um, if you would like access to the slides later, um, I'm happy to share them. I think a lot of this is, um, some of this is published work, and then some of the work is um, also available on uh, study websites. So with that, I think I'll go ahead um, and, and start the presentation. Um, I am, um, it's interesting because I am a genetic epidemiologist by training and, um, and a lot of the work that I have done really since about 2016 or so when I joined the faculty at UAB has centered around maternal and child health equity. And um, I have been at, in the Department of Epidemiology since 2014 and have had the opportunity to work with a good number of really smart and talented uh, uh, scientists who have really, I think, helped me put together an idea about what it means to do this work and, and what some of the remaining gaps are for maternal and child health, especially with respect to um, health equity. So um, I'm starting here. I was writing a paper earlier today on um, this very topic, actually more focused on maternal morbidity and mortality, um, but also encompassing uh, the child as well. And um, this is a conceptual model that we put together for the P3 Equate Network. So um, the P3 Equate Network is a, a maternal Morbidity and Mortality Network. Uh, the coordinating center is uh, located at UAB. I'll share more details about that as we go on in the talk. Um, but we put this conceptual model together that is informed by prior conceptual models that have been uh, published in the literature, which really talks about the numerous 
forces that contribute to maternal and child health. Um, many of them being structural, historical, systemic forces that really inform the ways in which mothers and children feel safe, get education, have food instability or stability, um, affects a person's outcome, where they live and what the demographics of those neighborhoods are, whether or not they have stable housing, um, if they have toxic exposures in the places that they live, whether or not they have transportation or access to care. Many, Some of you may know that there have been a number of uh, of hospitals, especially delivery rooms that have been shut down all over the state of Alabama. Alabama is uh, one of the states that has some of the worst maternal and child health uh, morbidity and mortality rates across the country. And so um, there are a number of forces that continue to perpetuate these health inequities for, for um, uh, maternal and child health in the state. There's also a historical precedent for mistrust of systems that, per, that further perpetuates an ability to have um, individuals, users of the healthcare system, really um, lend their trust to being a part of healthcare such that they're able to really benefit from uh, any services that are available that could help improve these inequities. And it's this really cycle that starts at preconception, leads to pregnancy, um, eventually postnatal care and then postpartum care as well that is part of the cycle that affects both moms and babies. The World Health Organization talks about mortal delays to health access and quality. The first delay being uh, the ability to even seek care. So if you, um, one, don't have trust in your local a provider or two, maybe there is not a local provider that is easily accessible to you because you have to get on a bus or have to drive two hours. Um, a lot of this leads to um, a second delay, which is notably the ability to reach out for help. So first you have to be in this idea, like a, a contemplation stage, right? Like that you're primed to seek help, uh, some help. And then you have to be able to have the ability to reach for help, and then the third delay being to receive adequate help, which is also a, a significant factor in um, accessing quality health and also even just at baseline having access to health. A fourth delay is more systemic. So the ability of systems to take responsibility for maternal mortality. Um, if we go back a few slides, you'll notice that there are a number, these ones in green, Jim Crow, the GI Bill, redlining, the 13th Amendment, slavery, um, that contribute to these other systemic uh, systems and injustices like racism, like disparities in um, how women are treated in um, these systems that really affect the ability for women to have equal or equitable maternal and child care. And so part of what we have done is um, throughout my time on the faculty is really try to identify ways in which we can make greater strides in uh, improving these inequities. And there are a number of precursors. So if you think about uh, the process by which you have these inequities in maternal morbidity and mortality and, and similarly for children, there are, there's the event, right? So um, whether or not a mom or a baby have good health outcomes at birth, postnatally, during pregnancy, et cetera. But there are these, these events and forces that happen earlier in what we call in epidemiology, the causal pathway. Like what are the things that are responsible or that are important in the pathway for causing the event. A number of um, risk factors uh, for adverse or bad health outcomes for moms and babies include conditions like gestational diabetes. Um, I mentioned at the top of the, of the call that I am a, I'm trained as a genetic epidemiologist and so one of my areas of interest is um, epigenetics. 
So basically the study of genetics, but sort of like not the genome itself, but like what happens to the genome when we're exposed to stress or when we're exposed to these different stressors that actually impact our genome in ways that cause different outcomes uh, for our health. And so um, back in 20, um, gosh, maybe this was 20, 2016 or so, I can't recall the year exactly. Um, we were really interested in whether um, there is intergenerational trans, uh, transmission of obesity in moms and babies. And we proposed different ways to study this. I was really interested in the epigenetics of intergenerational transmission of obesity. Um, and so Tim Garvey, who's here at UAB in, in the Department of Nutrition Sciences, and a number of other investigators, including Paula Chandler Laney and Lori Harper and others, Kirk Haberger, um, proposed a three-project study to the American Heart Association to understand if in utero stress that resulted from maternal obesity, um, also insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome, and or gestational diabetes, would lead to these long-term effects on body weight regulation and metabolism and affect the offspring as well, like also the babies, right? Like would the babies and or the kids also have obesity or cardiometabolic disease over their lifespan if the mom had obesity, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, and or gestational diabetes? And so there were three projects that were proposed, a mother-child study, a mother neonate study. So this mother-child project, we brought moms and kids who had had a gestational diabetes exposure four to 10 years ago. Um, we brought the, the moms and the kids into the clinic to um, measure uh, the obesity during pregnancy, metabolic syndrome, and gestational diabetes, but also uh, the current state of obesity, metabolic syndrome, and gestational diabetes, or well, diabetes, I should say, um, in, current, in current time. There were parallel projects that happened in moms and babies that day of birth. So instead of like four to 10 years ago, sort of a rep retrospective study, um, the clinical study was looking at day of birth, like are these conditions present and what's happening with the mom and the baby at delivery? And then to sort of look at the biological mechanisms, there was a study that looked at rodent models in utero uh, of in utero stress, so um, mice studies, um, to try and understand sort of the more um, mechanistic components of what we were trying to study in humans. And um, my component of this was to study the epigenetic modification of DNA to understand if these modifications that we might observe in moms and maybe the kids, but certainly in moms, given the exposure of obesity, metabolic syndrome, and gestational diabetes, were also present in the kids. Um, so this idea, again, that um, is it possible for uh, modifications to our genome that cause these adverse conditions, obesity, metabolic syndrome, and gestational diabetes, to be passed on from one generation to the next? And so um, we conducted what we call an EWAS, so an epigenetic, um, epigenome-wide association study in moms and kids so that we could identify if there were like markers of methylation that were associated with these adverse outcomes. Um, we did this in the moms and the kids, and then we took that to the neonates, so the moms and the babies, um, and then also to the, rat mo the mouse model to see if we found anything. And the idea was that um, if we could observe something in moms and kids four to 10 years after an exposure and also find it day of delivery, or maybe not, that that could tell us more about this intergenerational transmission of these adverse outcomes that then lead to disparities in whether or not people have adverse cardiovascular um, diabetes and other um, adverse effects of health, um, not only for the moms, but also the kids. And so what we found was that there were three groups that we were able to recruit, um, a normal weight group, 
an overweight obese group and um, a group with gestational diabetes. Um, and um, there were different data that were uh, collected for all these individuals. For those of you that are interested in research opportunities, these are data that were collected. Um, we have not only clinical, but also um, other survey data that's available. And then of course we have all of the DNA methylation data as well that if you're looking for projects to write papers on is available for you. Um, these are some of the characteristics of these populations. So if you'll notice, um, it was a rel relatively small group. So we had about 76 women in each group um, and um, a little, some diversity. Um, we did prioritize in this study, um, in the next study that I'll talk about, and then also in the P3 equate uh, studies, um, persons underrepresented by race ethnicity uh, with a predominance or focus on um, Black women and their babies because the, they have the highest rates of morbidity and mortality compared to other race ethnicities, as Camila noted in the introduction. All of a majority of these women had all delivered at UAB, which means we also have electronic health record data on all of them. And they're relatively young and about early 30, early to mid 30s. Um, and we did not collect any data on the fathers, but we were able to collect other data like one hour glucose, um, daily energy intake, and then whether or not they um, engaged in physical activity. And we found some differences between the groups, but nothing like super significant. However, what we did see was that there was um, greater BMI in the um, group with overweight over obesity and GDM groups compared to the normal weight, of course, with increasing centralized di distribution across all three groups. That means like, um, not only did we observe greater BMI in the groups that had a gestational diabetes pregnancy and or a pregnancy with overweight and obesity. So remember, these are moms that had their pregnancy four to 10 years ago and are now coming in for a visit. So now in present day, if they had a pregnancy with overweight or, or obesity and or gestational diabetes, um, actually, or gestational diabetes, then we saw greater BMI, higher BMI compared to moms that had normal weight during their pregnancy. Um, Waist hip ratio, interesting was interestingly, was actually pretty comparable uh, across all three groups. So here on the right hand side, however, um, there is sort of this dose response that we observed. So the normal weight moms had, or the moms who had a normal weight pregnancy had lower waist hip ratio compared to moms who had overweight over obesity or gestational diabetes. So. Um, some of some of the uh, work that we did did um, did uh, really lend itself well to some of the hypotheses that we had on early on, which was that children of women with overweight or obesity or gestational diabetes during pregnancy would have greater fat mass with distribution to the central compartment. So when uh, humans in general um, have a lot of obesity around their midsection, that's to be obesity that is um, more adverse than if you're to your health than if you have obesity elsewhere on the body, say, for example, the legs and the arms. And so what you want to try and avoid in life um, is an accumulation of that fat uh, or um, around the midsection, especially that visceral fat, the fat that sort of like gets in around your organs. And so that's what we were really interested in uh, for this group of moms and kids. And um, also uh, hypothesized that this increase in body fat um, of the children who had these adverse pregnancy exposures would be associated with dysmetabolism, and that there would be just generally met uh, metabolic aberrations in the kids. Um, and so these are the, the kids' data. Um, we had a predominance of uh, girls in the children's cohort um, and found that for those that had a mom who during pregnancy had had overweight or obesity or gestational diabetes, that we did observe that 
um, there were differences in these outcomes, including uh, when they were born. So um, you'll notice this gestational age at delivery is a little bit longer, not by much, but in at least a week for the kids who were born to moms with a normal weight pregnancy um, compared to those that were born to um, a, a mom with overweight or obesity or gestational diabetes. There were also differences in birth weight. So the kids that were born to, um, to moms who during pregnancy had gestational diabetes also had, had a higher birth weight compared to the other two groups. Um, and then there were also differences in whether these babies were breastfed or formula fed, which has a lot to do actually a lot uh, with some of those other factors that I showed in that very first slide uh, with respect to like the factors that influence health, including for example, um, the ability to breastfeed differs by race, ethnic, culture. Um, it's acceptance, for example, um, the ability to have a job that allows you to take breaks so that you can either breastfeed your baby and or take breaks so that you can use a breast pump to, to, um, to uh, save that breast milk for when you get home. And so sometimes it's easier, simply easier um, to formula feed. And so there you'll observe sometimes differences in whether or not um, babies are breastfed compared to formula fed. Children born to women with normal weight also had lower BMI and less body fat compared to those born to women with overweight or obesity or gestational diabetes. We um, sort of already allu alluded to that. Um, and the between group differences weakened when maternal results were added to the model. Um, but overall, um, we did find that maternal glucose concentration was positively associated with child percentage body fat and these associations were greater for the normal weight and GDM groups compared to overweight and obesity. Um, overall, the population, um, you, you will notice here, so this is weight for height. So we also looked at that uh, waist to hip sort of ratio for the kids, um, lower than the population average overall. Um, but children of mothers who had normal weight during pregnancy had smaller waist circumference than children of women who had these adverse pregnancy exposures. Leptin um, uh, is um, and leptin adiponectin ratios are two metrics that we use in metabolic um, science uh, to observe whether or not there are adverse metabolic disturbances in individuals. And so here are some comparisons for that as well. I won't go into those today, but for those of you that are really into um, metabolic uh, aberrations, I'm happy to share. But in general, what they tell us a little bit more about is whether or not someone is insulin resistant, which is that sort of precursor stage to diabetes and or general metabolic aberrations. And we didn't see any group differences in these uh, four major groups, which are HOMA IR, Matsuda index, free fatty acids, or inflammatory markers. These last ones are really important because they tell us a lot more about inflammation that might be happening in the body. So in general, um, we found that children of women with these at, um, um, sort of um, less favorable conditions, overweight obesity or gestational diabetes during pregnancy, had greater fat mass with distribution to the central compartment as compared to children that were born to women of normal weight. And this increase in body fat for these kids um, was, oops, was associated with dysmetabolism, especially for those markers that I told you are really important in telling us if there's sort of an increased risk for diabetes and obesity. Um, and these aberrations in children who were born to women with gestational diabetes were greater. They were like of higher um, uh, magnitude than those for children who were born to women of overweight, obesity, or normal weight. And so I think what we found from this study in general was that um, exposure to gestational diabetes really appears to have some um, implications for high risk in kids at least four to 10 years after delivery um, if the mom had gestational diabetes during pregnancy. I would say um, the second highest risk is for 
kids born to moms who had overweight or obesity during pregnancy. And so one of the other aspects of this that um, I have been really interested in and uh, one of my students, Nita Caney, um, was also interested in was um, using that epigenetic data um, to investigate whether there are accelerated epigenetic age changes um, for these different groups that we have in this study. And so um, what she did was she took um, the group that we recruited for this study. So moms who had a pregnancy complicated by gestational diabetes that occurred four to 10 years ago. Um, they, um, we had data, as I mentioned, on their glucose levels, whether or not they currently had type two diabetes, any sort of other conditions that might be present. Um, and what we found was that um, in the past, there were at least two studies that had reported that there was an increase in epigenetic age uh, uh, acceleration in uh, GDM exposed offspring. So kids that were born to moms who had gestational diabetes during pregnancy, um, and that also there was an increase in systolic and diastolic blood pressure, hemoglobin uh, globin and super iliac skin fold. Um, the second study showed that there was a similar pattern that was observed, but more on the insulin resistance, which is a precursor for type two diabetes and obesity. Um, and then also um, uh, this, um, this pattern of accelerated aging. So um, with epigenetics, what you're able to do is um, calculate an epigenetic age. So sort of like the biological or cellular age, and then you use that to compare to your chronological age. So you're measuring sort of the age of the cells to see if your body is aging at an equal or accelerated, in some cases decelerated rate compared to your chronological age. So if you were to take the age of my cells based on epigenetic age and the epigenetic age says that I am 70, well, I'm in my forties. And so that would suggest that I'm having significant stress or challenges on my body that are that are causing my body to age at an accelerated rate compared to the actual age that I am chronologically. And so this is really sort of fascinating, I think, science because it really enables us to look at an aspect of biological aging that we had not been able to measure previously in contexts like this, gestational diabetes, for example, and we're actually doing this now for preeclampsia as well, which is the next study that I'll talk about. Um, and so we calculated epigenetic age compared to chronological age in the moms and the kids who had exposure to gestational diabetes and those that did not. And then we uh, examined the correlations and then we tested associations with other markers that, had, uh, that were present. For those of you that are interested in the recruitment for this study, um, we can refer back to this to this slide. And again, happy to share the slides. For those of you that are interested in the how we get this data, so basically you take a, a purple top tube, so you draw blood from an individual. Actually, we did not draw blood from the kids. We tried, but we were not successful. Um, and so the blood came from the moms, but the, um, we were able to extract um, DNA from saliva from the kids. And so um, you take either whole blood or saliva and you extract the DNA from that. The DNA gets sent to a lab and then they run the, that DNA and sort of go along the genome um, for each individual and measure where there is notable methylation. These like we're gonna like go back to chemistry here, um, where these methyl groups are added to the five carbon of a cytosine along so along the genome, um, wherever there's a cytosine that is next to a guanine, if there's a methyl group attached, then the assays will quantify how many of those across the genome they are. Um, and the added methyl group, the methyl group is potentially not supposed to be there. So if it is there, then it tells us a little bit more about what's happening to this gene. The addition of the methyl group may cause the gene to shut off, which means that it sort of disrupts 
the function of the gene. Um, if these genes are shut off and they're good genes, then um, shutting off of that gene may lead to these adverse health conditions that we're observing. There were a number of anthropometric measures that were collected, including waist to hip ratio, BMI that I've mentioned before, um, the different uh, metabolic biomarkers that I've mentioned previously in the stage. Um, and then we calculated epigenetic age acceleration using the Horvath calculator. Um, and then there's a second one called Hanum. So these are um, sort of established calculators that are out there to help you um, determine the age of these cells. Um, and um, conducted statistical analyses for all of the comparisons that we did. And what we found was that in um, 66 moms who had a pregnancy with gestational diabetes and 71 moms who did not have a pregnancy with gestational diabetes, um, that there were differences in some of the markers that we're really interested in, like, for example, HOMI-IR. So the higher the number, the worse the, the, the um, insulin resistance. Um, these inflammatory markers like leptin, higher in the moms with gestational diabetes compared to the moms without. Um, this is cholesterol, HDL. So um, this was higher in the non-GDM moms, but HDL is kind of a good cholesterol. So um, you would expect that this number would be higher in the non-GDM mom. So this number is okay, actually. But glucose, you generally don't want a super high glucose. Um, and so this glucose is actually higher for the moms with a gestational diabetes pregnancy compared to those without. Um, and then similar for insulin. So you want a lower insulin number compared to fasting um, insulin. And we saw similar patterns for kids, although not as drastic or like as different as, as we saw with, with the mom. So you'll notice that these numbers are actually much more comparable, including insulin resistance, right? So you have 1.8 to 1.8 here um, for similar numbers of kids about similar ages. So 6.5 compared to 7.5. Um, males compared to females, about equal proportions. Um, and these numbers for cholesterol, glucose, and insulin were all pretty similar. But what we did see was that the mothers had a strong correlation between chronological age and epigenetic age for both clocks. Um, offspring, however, of the non-GDM moms, so the moms without a gestational diabetes, pregnancy had moderate correlations and GDMs with, um, or kids who had a GDM pregnancy had a stronger correlation between their uh, chronological and epigenetic age based on the Horvath clock. Um, in general, offspring had a stronger correlation for the clock for both groups. And so what does this mean? So this means that um, in, in these kids and moms, um, there were factors like HDL cholesterol that was associated with um, an increase in epigenetic aging compared to those moms without um, gestational diabetes, and that there were factors like insulin. So fasting insulin was significantly associated with accelerated aging in kids, um, but also leptin. Um, and additionally, um, we did these analyses by sex. So like boys and girls and did not find any significant results there. So for moms with a prior gestational diabetes pregnancy who were on average older than non-GDM mothers, um, the epigenetic age of offspring that were born to these moms who had a GDM pregnancy on average was lower than that of kids born to non-GDM moms. And um, accelerated epigenetic acceleration was associated with um, HDL cholesterol, independent of BMI, but not cell type. And then in the kids, there was an association between epigenetic age acceleration and fasting insulin. So what we're really taking away from this is that um, if we were sort of to identify biomarkers or like some sort of um, identifier for risk for disease that cholesterol and fasting insulin in the kids and the moms would be something that we would be interested in. Um, this, as I mentioned, was a, rep a retrospective study. So 
the exposure happened years ago and we're sort of measuring epigenetic age now, but I actually think that's ideal because you, you want some time to understand if your body is aging at a faster or slower rate um, than, your, than your chronological age. And then of course the clocks have been designed for the most part for adults. And so there is some, um, um, maybe just, I think, um, uh, lack of confidence that these clocks are ideal for pediatric populations. So um, there are a number of things that we're doing now, if you're interested in doing any of this work with us, um, feel free to join us. But um, this is work that was funded by the American Heart Association Strategically Focused Research Network on Translational Obesity. And, um, and that led then to the project that is currently funded um, by an R01 mechanism by the National Institutes of Health on epigenetic biomarkers of preeclampsia. And so for those of you that are less familiar with preeclampsia, this is a condition that affects two to 8% of pregnancies globally. After 20 weeks of gestation, it's characterized by hypertension or high, really, really high blood pressure and also protein in, your, in, um, in the urine, um, some organ complications depending on the case. And so it's actually a really serious condition that may lead to maternal mortality. It is, um, it is predominantly present, I would say, um, inequitably present in, um, in black women. Um, and we, and we do not fully understand the reasons why. And so the importance of this study is that if through epigenetic work, we're able to identify risk factors for like markers of increased risk for preeclampsia, that we might be able to intervene earlier in the pregnancy and really prevent preeclampsia in women and or be able to treat it much earlier on so that there are fewer adverse or bad outcomes for the mom and the baby. Some of the things that happen um, if you have preeclampsia is that there's um, a sort of vascular dysfunction, like it really affects the vascular system, um, uh, the way in which the baby gets oxygen, for example, um, and there are a number of um, not great outcomes that happen, again, to both the moms and the kids, some of which include mortality for either the mom or the kid or the baby. And so we really felt like if we looked at the epigenetics, the epigenome of the moms, and actually in the follow-up study, there are now kids involved also, that we might be able to identify these changes pretty early on. And so... Um, this epigenetic modulation really helps us understand if these methylation groups that I told you are attaching to the cytosines uh, along the genome um, are causing genes to turn on and off, primarily off, and if that's causing changes in what we see as health outcomes. And so we took data, actually samples from um, this CHAP study. So CHAP is chronic hypertension in pregnancy. Um, in the CHAP trial led by Alan Tita, whom I'll mention again later in, in the talk, has this bio repository of samples of women who participated in the trial to take hypertensive medication or medication for high blood pressure during pregnancy. And what we were able to do was take the DNA from those samples that were previously stored, send it off for these um, epigenetic assays. Um, to understand if there were um, places that were methylated along the genome that might help us understand this pathophysiology of preeclampsia and identify biomarkers for early detection management and treatment of, um, of um, this condition. And so what we've done so far, and actually I think I, oh, I did remove the slide. So what we've done so far is we've done this extracted DNA, sent the samples for assay, and now have data, uh, for DNA methylation data on over 1,400 women for whom we can do things like calculate epigenetic age acceleration, understand if there are specific uh, uh, 
parts of genes in the genome um, that are that are associated with preeclampsia and or some of the outcomes that happen when you have preeclampsia. Um, and so if you're interested in working with any of those data, those are going to be available immediately. Um, and that this this is an R01 grant. We're in our second year, third year, third year. Um, and so we're at the point where we're actually writing a lot of data, um, a, a paper, sorry, and abstracts. Um, and so um, a good time, I think, to collaborate. So in the next like five or seven minutes, um, I'm gonna share more about the P3 Equit Network, which kind of brings it all together. So Camila is very familiar with this, but um, the P -Equate, uh, P3 Equate Network is um, where um, a lot of what I have done uh, with this like very intense epigenetic and other science has come together with work that is happening uh, across the US. So um, this network comprises work that is done at UNC Chapel Hill, Northwestern University, The Ohio State University, Penn, um, also partner community partners like Connection Health and the North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University um, have community partners that are also a part of this. Dr. Tita is uh, a renowned uh, OB-GYN physician, maternal fetal medicine, uh, is an MD PhD who works here at UAB and does a lot of phenomenal work. And I've had the privilege to work with him, not only on this network, but also the CHAP epigenetics study. Um, and he leads the coordinating center that really brings together not only the research projects for the Equate Network, but also all of the community partners um, and these different cores that comprise different aspects of that original uh, conceptual framework that I showed you early on. And so the, the goal of this network is to work with communities and health systems, but most importantly, pregnant and postpartum persons to address racism and social determinants of health. So we can evaluate the effectiveness and implementation of strategies that either are in place or that we're creating that are meant to enhance access, quality healthcare information and experiences. And the idea is that by collaborating together, like not only all of the different scientific projects, but also the community partners across all these different states, that we might be able to also disseminate findings that inform policy and engage multiple stakeholders so we can be successful in the interventions that we're working on and that others have developed that we're also working to implement. And of course, as part of this, there's an opportunity to train the next generation of maternal and child health leaders. And so there are a number of guiding principles, uh, which is that all partners receive equal respect. So the community partners are authors on our papers. They come to all our scientific meetings. They inform the work that we do. Um, and so there really is this general principle of diverse perspectives being included, mutual benefit for all partners, um, and ultimately working to translate this research into practice and policy, which I think is most important. Um, it, it, this looks kind of complicated, but it's not. Um, so the network is led again by Dr. Uh, Tita. I'm a part of the coordinating center and we oversee a number of different cores. So the cores are here in purple and um, members of the network comprise the membership of each core. Um, but if you're interested in partnering with any of these, you're also able to do that. So um, for example, the social determinants of health and or structural determinants core um, is one that I'm a part of. And we're really working to understand what the social determinants of health are that contribute to maternal and child morbidity and mortality. Um, Cores on methods, data analysis, et cetera, are more hands-on, more of the data that's applied. And then all of these cores and the different committees help inform and support the different scientific projects that are part of this. And so there are a number of people from, again, all over the US that comprise the membership for each of these cores. Um, but really what it does is um, help bring the core work in concert with community, community partners and persons affected by um, adverse health outcomes, both moms and babies, so that together we can sort of better understand um, what's happening um, that is leading to inequities in maternal and child health for adverse 
morbidity and mortality. Um, there's a community approach to impact of racism on maternal health equity, like that's one of the projects, for example. Um, this more technical impact P3 is an evaluation of perinatal CV risk uh, uh, assessment using EHR data. The BELIEVE project has been very incredible, building equitable linkages with interpersonal professional education valuing everyone that's brought HBCUs into the equation and really used HBCU collaborations to bring in uh, partners that have been informing a lot of the science that we're doing. Um, and the idea is really to go beyond this network. And so for the work that you all do, I think it's really important for you to know about this initiative so that we can build bridges and collaborate to improve access and quality care for these populations um, and to the extent possible really engage stakeholders and really multiply the workforce of persons that are interested in this work. So um, the Equate Network is really centering community in the work that it's doing. I'm, I'm really proud to be a part of this and um, the work that is happening both at UAB and the other states that are a part of this is really incredible. Um, there is a lot of cross-project synergy um, and really, I think, uh, taking steps to address these inequities that are present not only in the state of Alabama, but also other, other states. So with that, I think I'm going to close so that we have some time for questions. I think we will have about 10 minutes left. Um, and I thank you for your attention. I know that it's late in the day, so thank you for taking the time. And I know that was a lot. <laughs> so, so no. have Dr. Dago, that was great. Thank you. Um, and we do have about 10 minutes left if we've got any questions. We've been monitoring the chat box and we haven't had any put in the chat box yet, but this is your opportunity. Um, you're welcome to put it into the chat box. You're also welcome to speak out. Um, we're using focus mode, so your um, your video won't be on recorded on the screen, but your voice will be, or we'll read off your question in the chat box. So what questions do you have for her? And I did note that um, at least one person was driving. So um, yes, feel free to unmute. Um, we can also talk just very generally about um, the field and um, opportunities either for collaboration or for expanding access um, or ways in which to get into these fields, genetic epidemiology or public health or what have you. Um, if you are joining as a community partner, I'd love to hear from you as well. Um, a lot of what we're doing in all of these projects is disseminating our findings. So um, you may have heard in my introduction that I'm really interested in science communication as well. Um, and one of the passions that I have around science communication is that I do um, thoroughly believe that there is a serious disconnect between the work that we do in science, like in the academy, in medicine, et cetera, um, and the knowledge and information that lay communities have to advocate for their health and their loved ones. Um, and it just takes a lot of time, like between when you have results from a project and present them at a national meeting and then they get published in a journal um, and then maybe the media picks up on it and then maybe the media gets it right in their interpretation. Um, and so that there's sort of this like really long process that um, inadvertently also, but maybe advertently affects people's ability to be informed and have accurate information to make good choices, especially in, in the face of inequitable access to healthcare. Dr. Hidalgo, I do have a question. Yes. Um, so I guess I didn't really find out about that these kinds of things just being researched or anything until I started going to school here and working here. So do you have like any recommendations about how we can make these findings more publicly known as opposed to like, you know, in journals or like scanning through PubMed and looking for anything? Is there like a way to get it more accessible to, I guess, the everyday person? Yes. Yeah, that is a great question. And I actually give a talk um, on how and like 
the average person can become a social media influencer and or just an influencer in their spaces. Because one privilege that we have, especially if you are in our school of public health, either as a student or staff person or a faculty person, is that you're privileged with information that few other people have. And if you're in training, um, let's say um, in our master's program or in our PhD program, what you're further privileged with is this ability to sort of code switch, right? Is like take scientific information and translate it into language that is lay and that people like the common person that is at the fourth to sixth grade reading level will understand. And so if you're on social media, if you um, have church groups or community groups that you belong to, those are prime places to share information that you have learned about um, in your programs or in your work or academic or, or um, clinical environments with people who would not otherwise have that information. And instead what they're exposed to are people telling them to like squeeze lemon into their mouth and cure all of their ailments, right? Like, cause that's what TikTok will tell you. Um, so I would say wherever it is that you are either physically or digitally is a great place to start. Did that answer your question? That's a wonderful suggestion. I was actually thinking about something like that earlier. Um, just, I'm 28 years old. I mean, I'm very active on social media. And I was thinking that with everything that I'm learning, I was wondering, you know, you have to get past the scary part about putting yourself out there on social media and, you know, all the things that you get in your head about. And I was thinking that maybe it might be good to like post some content about it, or maybe like start a blog or something just to relay what I'm learning. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I started out on Instagram doing fashion blogging when I was a grad student slash postdoc. And when I really found my footing and like found my footing in that I gained confidence in what I knew in science and like what I, and that I like confidently called myself an epidemiologist, I sort of made the switch um, and started science communication on Instagram. And, um, and when I tell you that that just like blew up, it um, became such an avenue for community building, uh, increasing trust with communities that otherwise don't have great trust in medical systems and in science generally. Um, the science communication that I did between 2020 and 2023 um, resulted in collaborations for grants. I got invited to the White House for the communication that I did during COVID especially. So I think you just never know what will come of it. But I think more importantly, it is your way to give back in a timely manner that does not involve all of the sort of red tape that we're exposed to publishing in journals, only presenting at scientific meetings where our communities are not present, et cetera, et cetera. That is a fantastic sounding presentation. And I can guarantee we're gonna approach you about that. And yeah. I, also know, I also know that it's intimidating. First of all, you want information about how to get out there and how to become an influencer in your spaces. But another thing that I think a lot of us can find really intimidating is that when we put out information that we feel strongly is truth, um, and we get argued with online, yeah. oh. how do you defend that? Or how do you, you know, enter into that type of a conversation? And um, yeah, yeah. And I do cover that in that talk. I think um, what I'll say briefly about that is that what I've learned from COVID communication is that um, one, people in general are very binary thinkers. And that we we lack as sort of a population, the ability to say, okay, this isn't just a yes, no, alive, dead, like it's not binary at all times. There are middle grounds. Um, and that if you recognize that and recognize that oftentimes people are coming from a place of wanting to do good, 
good for themselves, good for their families, but also from a place of fear of like, not really knowing if the information that they have is true or not true. Um, and so that if you're able to meet people where they are, um, that even if you don't change their minds, because you're not in the business of changing minds, you're in the business of disseminating information that is fact and evidence-based, um, that you're doing um, a, a world of good by even just planting seeds that that may get people to think beyond their original point of uh, and frame of view. So um, I would say, yes, um, it's actually a very popular talk. I give it to several groups and I've been invited back several times. So would be happy to consider that. Um, I think as we close, let me take this question from Briand. Um, curious to know the contribution of the father in all of this. Yes, so um, that is an excellent observation because I did not talk about the fathers in any of the studies that I mentioned. Um, I will speak specifically for the study that involved the moms and the kids four to 10 years after having a gestational diabetes pregnancy. And I will tell you that those moms were recruited from the UAB health system, and we were not able to get a lot of good information from the fathers. And oftentimes, um, um, we're not like in a lot of the cases um, did not have a father present when we were recruiting women into the study. And so there is an absolute absence of information, crucial information um, that would in, involve um, the father both sort of socially, but also biologically. And so I think it's an area for scientific exploration that is a gap in our knowledge currently. Yes, thank you so much. Um... You've given us so much to think about, and <laughs> I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us tonight. Um, everybody, we want to be mindful of the time that we said we would take. Sure, yeah. <laughs> your schedules. Lastly, thank you so much, Dr. Hidalgo. I really appreciate you taking your evening time to be with us tonight. Yes, thank you all. Thanks so much. Thank you, Julie. Good night, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.